already amended their zoning codes to allow more and more of this in their cities. So we are advocating for um, Jacksonville to allow more of this in our city here. So what we kind of like to come out of the forum is just kind of network, get to know um, everybody who's interested in some of these topics and these issues, um, try to figure out, you know, where is the public interest in this, and then out of that, try and facilitate um, some ordinance changes here in um, Jacksonville, work with the planning department and the city council. So um, with that, this is David Reed. He's with the JEA Conservation Center, and he's allowing us to use the space. So I'll let him tell you a little bit about the space that we're in, too, which is a pretty cool space. Yeah, thank you all very much for coming. This is uh, JEA's Conservation Center. We use it uh, mainly for training for our conservation programs. We just did the home and patio show, so a lot of our displays are still kind of boxed and packed and thrown in. But uh, just wanted to welcome everybody. Uh, some quick housekeeping things. We are tight in here, which is very, you know, which is not what we're used to in this particular building. But if there is an emergency, there's an exit behind us. And of course, where you came in, just just leave and, uh, uh, in as orderly a fashion as possible. This was a display room at one time, so there's four boxes all throughout here. We made sure that they were shut, but please be careful when you're coming and going between the seats. There are some trip hazards. Uh, there's a water fountain right over here in the corner and restrooms. The door handle does not pull down. It's an old style door handle. You just pull on it. The restrooms are open. Uh, and like I said, the water fountains are over there. If anybody has any special needs or anything for, for evacuation, just let me know and we'll, we'll be sure to make that happen. And uh, just again, I wanted to welcome everybody and hope tonight's a great night for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Um, for those of you that don't know a lot about urban agriculture, we hope that tonight um, you'll walk away from here with just a little bit more knowledge about some of the different topics. Um, the city of Jacksonville right now does not allow any urban agriculture basically in um, the zoning the way that it's written. Um, and that includes actually community gardens. Um, they're not written in at all. It's not that they're not allowed, but they're not written in. Neither urban farms. Um, you only keep hens if you're on rural residential. Um, aquaculture isn't addressed in our zoning code at all either. So these are all um, beekeeping isn't either. So these are some things that we would like to see changed. And um, as we go through our panelists tonight, um, we'll talk to you a little bit about each of these different issues. Um, some of the reasons why um, people are interested in this is the local food movement. Um, a lot of people are really concerned about what's in their food, how far is it traveled to get on their plate, what did, say, the chickens, what, did, what were they eating before they came and you bought those eggs in that store. We also all know that um, food prices are rising too. So these are all things that uh, people are concerned with. More and more people in Jacksonville are wanting to grow their own food. So um, we just would like the city to relax its laws a little bit. doesn't necessarily mean everybody is going to go out there and participate in it, but for those who, who want to do it, we'd like the city to put a little bit of structure in place so that we're allowed to do it. Thank you, Amanda. In addition to uh, updating the ordinance to bring Jack's laws in line with the rest of the nation, this, we want to bring you a resource center. And this panel of experts here uh, know everything there is to know, I think, about a wide variety of urban ag issues. We have chicken experts. We have food forest experts. We have animal husbandry experts. We have construction experts. Slow food, and then uh, uh, Alan with uh, restaurants. So there's a lot of knowledge here. And the way this forum is going to work tonight is the panelists are going to give between a five and a seven minute presentation. And we're going to hold all questions until after the panelists are completed. Once the panelists have delivered their message, then we'll open the floor to questions. And the way the questions are going to work is they're going to have to be uh, very succinct. One question at a time. We invite you to direct your question to a panelist. Or if you don't know the panelists, appropriate panelists, direct it to Amanda or I. And then we'll uh, choose the panelists to answer the question. So you have. Uh, during Q&A, uh, we ask that you limit your questions about one minute, no <coughs> monologues or diatribes. Just uh, ask the one question, we'll get it to the panelists, 
and we've got a lot of ground to cover, and we only have an hour and 45 minutes, an hour and a half, so we want to move very quickly. If you have to leave, just go ahead and leave. We thank you very much for your attendance, and uh, um, Amanda is going to introduce the first four panelists. Uh, she'll introduce each panelist before their, their talk, and then I'll introduce the second four. But thank you again, and we hope that what comes out of this forum will be a broad knowledge of issues and interest in urban ag in Jacksonville. We invite you to see us afterwards. We're going to create several sub-working groups, a plant group, a chicken group, animal husbandry group, a bee group, etc., and make sure that we keep food legal here in Jacksonville. So. Real food. The first panelist is Richard. He's the founder of Slow Foods First Coast, and he has a blog um, called eamerica.com. He's a background in urban planning, and he currently resides in St. Augustine. Can everybody hear me if I just talk without a microphone? Yeah. That'd be all right. Yeah. Yeah. I don't use video. I don't use video. Okay, we'll use the microphone. Uh -huh. Shall I stand? Yes. yes, please. Can I? Okay. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, actually, very surprised so many people came out to talk about chickens tonight. Uh, and and thank you to Amanda, uh, Amanda and uh, Kevin for putting this together. Although I gotta say, I've never been called an expert on anything before. Except for my wife, usually she says a negative thing. <laughs> but, um, but my name is Richard Baldonga. I'm the founder of Slow Food First Coast. We are a, uh, a local nonprofit organization that supports um, the local food movement. And um, some of you may have attended last year's Tour de Farm event, which we organized, which was a uh, ginormous undertaking. But, but it was 24 venues across North Florida that opened up their doors from farms to local food producers to beekeepers to you name it. Folks that wanted to share their craft and, and their, uh, their love with, uh, with the citizens of North Florida. And in, in one <coughs> Sunday afternoon, 8,000 farm visits uh, were, were attended. So that was a pretty, pretty remarkable number, I thought, for a first time event. You know, I, I could talk about many things uh, tonight, and I know, thankfully for you, I only have five minutes to do, to do so. Uh, and I could talk about why supporting small family farms is so important and, and leaving our dollars in our local economy, the multiplier effect that that has. Uh, I could talk about from a sustainability, uh, you know, from, pardon me, from a sustainability point of view that uh, reducing the carbon footprint by eliminating the, the tremendous amount of transportation involved in our food system, why that is so important. Um, I could talk about how local farms can serve open space and wildlife habitat. Uh, I could talk about the food deserts here in Jacksonville and how many of our neighborhoods have no access to fresh food whatsoever. Uh, I'm going to leave that to the other experts on the panel. I think what I'm going to focus on for, for my last probably one minute at this point is, uh, is economic development and how I see agriculture, local agriculture, as uh, a stimulus for economic development. You know, we're going through the, the greatest recession, or, or did, or some are still in it, uh, in, in our lifetimes. And uh, job creation is, is, a, is a big you know, phrase out there. The way I see local farming is that uh, it's, it's an easy way and a very cost-efficient way to create jobs and to empower people with real-world skills that they can then take on and turn into small businesses. Um, I think it starts at the uh, childhood level. I'm a, I'm, an educator. I'm a middle school teacher in St. John's County. Uh, my organization has established or helped to establish 17 school and community gardens. And I think it starts at that young age, um, teaching kids the importance about healthy eating habits, giving them gardening skills that they can then take on for the rest of their lives. But I think what we need to focus on tonight is not just obviously those children in the future, but the present. And You've got a lot of un underutilized land and space in, in the city of Jacksonville, especially in the inner urban core. And you've got a lot of teenagers and young adults who are unemployed or underemployed. And they're young entrepreneurs. Unfortunately, a lot of them are, are entrepreneurs selling drugs and, and, and other illegal items. 
Why not give them skills and the opportunity to to grow things that are not only legal but beneficial to the community? Give them the skills to then take those products, turn them into value-added products. And whether you're talking about a canning facility, a freezing plant, something where local local young farmers, farmers, gardeners, whatever you want to call them, can take those products, turn them into something bigger and better. Use that potential, capture that potential. We have so much potential in this area with, with young people that are being underutilized. We can take their talents and their energy. We have a, a uh, law that was recently passed in, in the state of Florida called the Cottage Bills Law. I don't know if some of you are familiar with it or not, but up till now, in the state of Florida, if, um, if you made jams at home, or if you made pickles at home, or you've got some you know, great brownie recipe, and you've got some great brownies you want to sell at a farmer's market, you were unable to unless these products were prepared in a certified kitchen. But the law uh, that was recently passed gives the opportunity to millions of unemployed or underemployed Floridians looking for a little extra money to sell their products up to a $15,000 limit per year. So think about all your neighbors. Think about all the young people on the northwest side, here in Springfield, wherever. Think about wherever you came from tonight. Think about all those people that could be making some money and then spending that money, reinvesting that money right here in our own community. Think about the fact that, even though we're wonderful experts, None of us here are pioneers. All of the things that we're going to talk about tonight are things that are happening and have happened since civilization began. And you know, places like uh, Detroit and Milwaukee get this bad rap all the time in the news, and yet they're the leaders. They're the people at the forefront of what we're discussing tonight. We can learn a lot from some of these other cities across the United States, and, and we have the potential, certainly we have... The, I think a passionate group to get this going, but what we need is city leaders to step forward, we need uh, teachers to get involved, we need churches to get involved, we need everybody, it's a team effort, it's going to take a team. But we have the capability, we have the tools, and uh, it's a matter of harnessing all of that together uh, through school gardens, community gardens, changing the ordinances, buying a couple of chickens, supporting your local farmers, all these things that are simple, simple actions that we can take. We're not talking about transforming the world here. We're talking about changing a few things that can transform our city, uh, make it more livable. So uh, I've probably gone on too long. All right, thank you. Let me take a little quick break here. Ask the panelists to stand up and scoot their chairs back, pull the tables back. We're going to bring in another row of chairs. Uh, Mark, if uh, I can get you to help David and some of the gentlemen you can help David bring some of these chairs. We're going to create another row. And Richard was right on point with uh, the economic leg of Urban Act. If you all don't mind, just kind of each one of you just slide your chairs back four or five inches. We'll be able to get a, another row. Richard was right on point with the economic impact of Urban Act. There are so many opportunities for students and young people to take advantage of. Um, what I call high tech, small scale, very intensive farming in the urban core, and make money. There's uh, uh, high revenue, high cash value crops out there, herbs, vegetables, and they can be readily grown in, within the urban core and sold to uh, local cafes and restaurants. Alan's going to speak a little bit more about the restaurants at the end, but um, lots of opportunities. For economic and ecological and social slash community development with urban act. I like to plant plants on roofs. I do rooftop gardens and green roofs. It happens when we talk about the green roof and breaking ground. In a three meter by three meter square on the breaking ground green roof, we grew pounds and pounds and pounds of tomatoes this year. They're still up there. And all kinds of vegetables. So you can take a two inch layer of soil and grow a food forest on a roof. Now, I say that rooftops are the new frontier for Florida agriculture because there's so much wasted space on buildings and it's so easy to grow plants uh, on rooftops. So, all right, we're gonna uh, move on. Amanda's gonna introduce our next speaker. Okay, the next speaker is Brandon and he is a local underground urban farmer. He has expertise in a lot of different things. So, turn over to Brandon. Thank you. Uh, yeah, 
Actually, I just wanted to talk about. Um, uh, I just wanted to talk about uh, home food production and growing as much food in a small space as you can. And I just want to really briefly cover some of the things that uh, my wife and I have uh, been doing, and uh, hopefully later on people can ask more specific questions. But uh, uh, in general, uh, the, the two main factors we were considering was uh, sun exposure and how to use all the uh, available waste products as much as we can and to try and create a, a closed loop. But, um, so our first project is really the chickens, which is sort of the, uh, the gateway drug to all things, you know, urban <laughs> So um, we ended up getting four egg-laying hens, and, uh, well, basically, we tried to find a, a shadier part of the, uh, of the yard so it wouldn't take up space that could be used for raised beds and things like that. And, um, you know, the biggest concern there, obviously, is having a really good enclosure because even in a, an urban environment, there are a lot of predators, raccoons, things like that, which will get them. But, uh, you know, it's, they're a very effective use of space because basically they're going to eat weeds, they're going to eat bugs, and they're going to turn it into a really high value product for you. And, uh, you know, you can grow as much vegetables as you want, but uh, to have a high quality protein like eggs is really helpful. But, uh, yeah, and Basically, we try to avoid buying expensive coop like the ones you'll see online for two grain. Basically, we use salvage material, wood, and chicken wire, and uh, you know, I'd say overall it probably costs less than fifty dollars. And you know, comparing that to the cost of organic eggs, we really came out ahead. Um, but second to that, really one of the most effective things we did was we started a small aquaculture project, which uh, for people who may not know, it's uh, basically fish farming, but then um, you're also growing plants, but unlike a hydroponic system where you have to add artificial fertilizers, you basically take the um, fish waste and you push that you know, into a tray, usually with like uh, clay pebbles or something similar, and that's your, your free organic fish food fertilizer. Um, so we researched it and found that uh, tilapia are really the best option for our climate. Um, they're extremely hardy fish. They can take really high temperatures, which is important for where we are. And uh, also they can eat just about anything. Um, so incorporating the chickens, what we found out was one of the most uh, healthy things for them to eat is algae. And so actually what you can do is you can take some of the, uh, the chicken manure, put it in the burlap sack, and you actually seed the water with that, and the nitrogen causes an algae bloom, and then they go through and eat all the algae. So, you know, it's again, it's creating a closed loop, and um, basically, the second thing to consider is stocking density, and um, you can include, you know, I think safely one fish per five gallons, and uh, so what we did was we ended up finding a uh, a four or five hundred gallon tank that we got for a good price because it was from a uh, like a tank depot and they sold us the bandage one for cheap and we just patched it. But uh, yeah, and then besides that, you can get just a simple water pump and uh, pump that up into a tray with your uh, your soil medium and your clay uh, pebbles and things like that. But uh, yeah, from there, uh, our second the other big project was uh, miniature goats. So we got uh, two Nigerian dwarf goats which are uh, actually a lot smaller than most people realize and they produce a surprising amount of milk, uh, high quality milk. And so really for even two miniature dwarf goats you only need about a, say a 30 by 30 foot space and uh, I guess what a lot of people don't realize is they are a, a prey animal instead of a predator so they're surprisingly quiet. They tend to, once they have a little comfortable space, they tend to stay there. But, um, yeah, and another thing there, the way you're including all your waste products is we would um, grow things like corn in our raised beds and then when you were done, you would actually just let the goats go through and eat all the corn stalks and things like that. And they loved it. It was like candy for them. And so we would uh, actually get about a half a gallon of milk a day, which I think at Whole Foods is probably $6 for uh, half a gallon of goat's milk. So comparing that to the cost of hay, uh, we really came out ahead there. And um, you know, we, would, we learned how to make uh, feta cheese, things like that. Yeah, it's really a lot of fun. And uh, from there, we started a, a little mini orchard uh, on the south side of our house, which has the best sun exposure. It's actually a long, thin strip, uh, probably five feet wide by 30 feet long. And so 
we were worried that we would only be able to include maybe three or different types of trees. But what I did a little bit of research and found that um, you could actually do a high density planting. So we ended up buying olive trees and fig trees and planting them five or six feet apart. And then what you do is you actually just trim them fairly heavily each fall and winter. And they'll actually produce even more that way than if you were to plant them, say, 15 feet apart. Um, but yeah, we ended up including olive trees, um, mulberries, figs. I also discovered um, there's a, a tree called the moringa tree, which is from uh, India, that it's one of the highest biomass plants on earth. And uh, the leaves, the pods, just about everything is edible. So, and it's uh, very drought tolerant, so I recommend anyone who is interested to look that up. But, uh, yeah. And uh, oh, from there, then our uh, final project was uh, bees, which is also you get basically a very high value product, and you essentially don't have to feed or water them. And uh, basically, the biggest decision you have to make is the type of hive. Now, the traditional hive you're used to seeing is called a Langstroth hive. Uh, that's what the big boxes and the bars. Um, and unfortunately, that's a fairly expensive option. And so what we discovered were uh, top bar hives are actually a much better option. And that uh, essentially looks like a trough with four legs. And uh, what it does is instead of putting in your, your, your bars, you allow the bees to create their own frame, you know, how, how they naturally would. And uh, you know, I think um, they've done really well. We don't use any chemicals on them. Um, they're sort of manual uh, pest control methods, which includes uh, screen bottom boards where some of the mites that they get will actually fall through and then can't climb back up. Um, but yeah, it's just a, a great return on investment and uh, it's been very successful. So yeah, that's about it. And I'm hoping uh, if anyone has questions later, I'll try and cover it as well as we can. I read that it takes 200,000 flowers to make uh, one gallon of honey. So that's cool. I want to take a break just real quick here. And we sent letters of invitation to different council people, representatives for this area. I would uh, like to ask if there's any city council people here in the audience, if you could just raise your hand, introduce yourself real quick, Ms. Boyer. Uh, Lori Boyer, and I represent City Council District 5, which is San Marco on the south side. Thank you for coming. Yeah. Anybody from the Mayor's Office of the State? Okay, we're going to move on. Our next guest is Lorreen Husband. Lorreen is the Director of Healthy Jacksonville um, with the Duval County Health Department. The first thing I ask Amanda is why am I on this panel? Um, and um, what Healthy Jacksonville is, is we form coalitions with uh, the community, all different sectors to try and address the chronic diseases and any other issues that we might have as a community. And as you very well know, uh, diabetes, childhood obesity, adult obesity, uh, cardiovascular diseases, all those and a myriad other lots of diseases that Duval County has, we are like top of the nation. And the only way we know how to address this issue is that because we have done, I mean, based on research and just looking around, we have to put the power back in the hands of the people. That's the only way we're going to solve those problems. So that's how I've come to meet most of these guys who are on this panel, by um, bringing together people, different sectors, some of whom are represented here, like, um, like you may not think when you're looking at a food system, how does waste management fit in? If you do not include it at the table, you will not resolve your issues because you're always going to decide one thing or another. So what about the sheriff's office? If you're going to have a community garden, should you include the sheriff's office at the table? Yes, because you need security for your community garden. And uh, actually today, we launched, um, officially launched the Food Policy Council for Duval County. Some of the people here were represented. And I would like to invite everybody to come out and join the Food Policy Council for Royal County because we need you. It's going to take everybody, government sector, private sector, consumers, which is everybody, all of us are consumers, to make this happen. And to lead us towards this effort, I'd like to introduce Bruce, who's back there. He is the executive director of Second Harvest. 
and Bruce is going to lead us through this process to help us um, to gain the tools that we need to change policy to um, because um, all these ideas are great, but like some of my friends here will tell me all the different citations they're receiving, they're very costly. My friend Lauren has lost her chickens. That's very costly and also very damaging to the soul. So what do we need to happen? We need to make sure that the audiences that we need in place are there. We need to tell our city council representatives, the state government, we need to let them know what we as consumers need because the government works for us, not the other way around. And so what Healthy Jacksonville does is we facilitate these conversations. And as um, I'm a, an employee of the state, so technically I cannot advocate for one thing or another, but I can help you connect you with the different people and the resources, including money. We need to make this happen. So if you need to, and we also, um, one of the things we do is we work with school children a lot, including college students, to help give them the tools to guide our future. Because as a country, we are in danger of not succeeding to see the next generation of young people need to be uh, senior citizens because we are dying out based on what we are eating and what we are not doing for our health. So I could talk about this like all night, but I will stop. And, uh, <laughs> Master's in Environmental Science. She um, works at War on Poverty, and she's also here as a um, she's one of the coordinators of the Arlington Community Garden. So she's going to talk to you a little bit about um, community garden. Good evening. Um, so yes, I am here wearing two hats. One is as a steering committee member of the Arlington Community Garden, which is just over a year old at this point. Um, and my second hat is as a project coordinator with War on Poverty, and I work. Um, working with the community gardens, or community and school-based gardens, as well as the nutrition education program that we have to complement the gardening programs that we have. So um, both of my hats are, are near and dear to my heart. But um, for Arlington Community Garden, we are a community garden. We rent plots to people. It's, it's pretty standard practice, as you would think of a community garden. I rent a plot, I grow in, I grow my food, I take it home, and that's great. One of the unique things about Arlington Community Garden that I think is really important and impressive is that we have seven plots that we have dedicated out of our 32, and I'm probably wrong. Am I wrong, Donna? Sounds good. 30, we're at 30 plots or so. Um, we have seven of them that are dedicated solely for producing food for the Arlington Community Services, which has their own local food pantry right around the corner from us. And so, what we do is we've partnered with Jacksonville University. We have a professor there who has a biology program, um, is a professor in the biology department. Her students grow heirloom seedlings for us, which we then put into the garden, harvest them, you know, tend to them, harvest them, and it's great. Since January, we've donated over 130 pounds of food to them. Um, in a very short amount of time, that's a lot of food when you look at the fact that before our donations to them, they were not able to give out any food that was fresh. And it's wonderful to be able to provide the canned goods to people, but those fresh fruits and vegetables are, at this point, highly sought after. Um, I was actually speaking with their executive director the other day, and she said, I had one gentleman who said, no, no, I'm all set, I, I'm, I'm all set, I don't need any of that, and then he walked away and he thought, we came back and said, can I actually, may I have some of that? And so, you know, she loaded them up with a couple bags and off she went, um, and off he went. So that's one thing that's unique. And, and in my opinion, how that fits into the larger system of urban agriculture is that it's all about individuals being able to do their piece, to play a part, but it's about seeing that garden as, as a way to really feed people. And if you have one small garden that can donate 130 pounds with a few volunteers since January of this year, what can you do if each of these gardens is dedicated solely to that purpose? What can you do if, if that garden is fitted specifically for the needs and the interests of that community? What, what then can you do? How much food could you grow? My War on Poverty hat incorporating the nutrition education component, like Richard was saying before, you know, and, and other people in Lorene as well, with all of the issues that we have, especially in Health Zone 1, which is our urban core of Jacksonville that has the highest rates of obesity and hypertension and all of these related issues, what can you do with that food 
Well, if you have a comprehensive nutrition education program, you understand how to cook it and how to prepare it and why it's beneficial to you and, you know, being able to incorporate the personal aspect of each individual into that and realizing that food fuels you. It is who you are. So when you lose your chickens, yes, it hurts your soul, but food fuels that too. And so it's, it's all a bigger piece. Um, and so I think, again, like everybody else here, I could continue to go on, but I will stop at that. Thank you. Okay, we have the panelists uh, in uh, uh, backwards order. So, Laura, we're going to skip over you, not for a minute, yeah. just for a second. <laughs> and we're going to bring Eli about. At least I got a chair. Cool. <laughs> you know, it's, it's all about. Um, Resources. We've got a great panel here. There's a lot of resources in the audience. Uh, Amanda and I and, the, and some of the panelists are working on drafting model ordinance language for all the various types of urban ag. And we would like to have this language to Planning Department OGC and the council people before the end of the year. We want to move on this, but we need help. So. Uh, we need help with you contacting your council people. We also need help with you helping us review and come up with some reasonable language for the uh, model ordinance. So afterwards, please, uh, if you're interested in working with us, please come see us. Now, I want to introduce Eli and Val, two of my very close friends, uh, inspirations. Uh, Eli knows plants better than anybody, I think. He, uh, when I struggle to find a plant for a green roof, Eli will have a suggestion, and we put it in the harshest of places on a roof, and it flourishes. So his knowledge is, um, is renowned with respect to plants. Val studied permaculture in Hawaii, and they have a wonderful yard that's full of food. And I want to ask him to tell you about it. Thank you everybody for being here. This is so exciting. Um, I feel like my brothers and sisters are here. <laughs> Jacksonville is so big, but um, sometimes I don't get that sense of community so much. So thank you for coming. Um, so permaculture, maybe many people have, don't know what that is. Um, it was a word coined by Bill Mollison um, uh, you know, back in the 70s or something. Um, it means permanent agriculture. And he feels that there's no permanent culture without permanent agriculture. So um, imagine, if you will, you know, it, in three years' time, um, you can take a piece of land and turn it into a food forest. And then after that three years, you can walk away. And it will, it will keep continuing to be a food forest um, for whoever lives there, for their children, for your children, your grandchildren. Um, I love organic farming. Uh, permaculture includes organic farming, um, but if you leave a plot um, of vegetables, it's going to turn back into grass in um, that short time. So this is a way of, um, yeah, it's, it's here. <laughs> I'll think of more to say in a minute. There's um, a shot of the actual edge of our garden flowing over into the street. You can see it's a very biodiverse edge of food producing plants. And each one of those plants is placed there with direct purpose. It might look like a mess if you're not familiar with this type of agriculture. But literally everything in there serves some sort of purpose um, to bring in insects that pollinate fruit trees. There's probably about 10 different fruit trees planted right there. There's a the moringa here. There's a moringa tree. There's a moringa tree. There's a moringa tree. There's a cranberry hibiscus that we use in the peas. There's a dune sunflower. It's a native. Um, there's a swale right here. You cannot see it. It's covered with mulch, but it catches on. <coughs> so all the water from the road runs <coughs> off. There's a ditch dug the whole length of the street. So we're taking the runoff off of the road and bringing it right into our garden. And we'll take as much as we can get. It's been a drought for quite some time. And we take what we can get, and um, you know, to the untrained eye, these systems don't really look like a garden. But when you walk through, there's food production everywhere. And uh, 
like Valerie said, that that was a people used to park on that a year and a half ago. So in a year and a half, you can get you know rampant fertility. And most of those plants are, are building soil fertility in the ground and creating so much habitat that every day it's just a new animal, a new bird, a new stuff we've never seen before. It's just appear in every yard. It, um, landscape in this technique to produce just, there would be no food shortage ever again. <laughs> and that's because it's regenerative agriculture. It's not just sustainable. We're not staying at this level. Permaculture is it's bringing it back to where it needs to be. And you can go out into the country, but the land is created out there as well. Um, so why not start right in your front yard, or your backyard, or your side yards? Um, and, it, and it's really empowering. Um, you're able to take responsibility for your own health. Um, <coughs> fresh fruits and vegetables will cure degenerative diseases and chronic diseases. Um, so if it's right outside your door, we'll have a healthy world. <laughs> okay. There's, there's all kinds. There's lemongrass and... Um, Literally, right when you walk out in front of our door of our house, we have kale, and Vega, like, and everything. Just as you walk outside the front door. Goal is to and have my brother's dad is very happy there. Permaculture so. <laughs> very well integrates structures. It ties in with everything we're talking about here because the animal systems work very well to, um, you know, regulate the pest management. There's integrated pest management happening with the chickens and um, you know other other fowl. <laughs> and uh, you know, water catchment's huge. We we don't let anything run off of our property. All the water needs to be stored in the ground, not in barrels. I mean, barrels are cool, but you want that to be in the ground. Um, so building soil fertility. If everyone does this, we'll we'll um, replenish the groundwater. And spring lines that are dried up will start to run again. You know, there used to be springs that used to flow into the St. John's River, and they're all dried up. And this is the way that we can take responsibility and actually ourselves, as a, as a group, as individuals and a community, replenish our water. We can teach you how to do this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like I said, there's a little friend over there. Um, we babysit her and she actually planted all those plants. Um, biodiversity, I don't know if you mentioned that word, but that's key in all of this. Um, it, doesn't, it does not work unless you have many, many species of plants. This whole monoculture approach to agriculture does not work. Everyone is And this is not a new, a new fad or any big old thing. There's actually, if you want to look it up, there's in Davis, California, there's a place called Village Homes. It's a 70 acre plan community um, with 250 homes. And they did it in a permaculture style, um, through trees and swales and, um, you know, doing stuff. <laughs> 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 I'm not going to lie, back in law school, one of my favorite courses um, was constitutional law and due process. I love due process. And uh, they were cited recently for having, by the city of Jacksonville, for having, for growing food in their front yard. To me, growing food is one of the most fundamental rights we have as Americans. Okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. We don't want yeah. to let that slip away. So I want to just take 30 seconds, a minute, guys, and tell the audience about your experience with the uh, uh, <clears throat> Yeah, we, had, we got a yellow notice posted on our door. <laughs> Maybe some of you have gotten that as well. Uh, we had the first line checked off, which was any nuisance, so called nuisance vegetation above 15 inches um, needs to um, either be cut down or the city would come out um, after 17 days and um, they'll check on you. And if it's not done, they will do it for you and send you a bill. And, and this has actually happened. I, uh, there's a friend of mine at the zoo, he's a horticultural supervisor. And he got this notice and he just kind of ignored it. And they, they did it while he was at work and he got billed for $400. So I think there's better uses that city can, you know, better ways the city can get money and better ways to use that money than, you know, citing people for this. So um, there's no way we're going to cut anything down. All of this is like our children, <laughs> fruit trees, and um, 
you know, all these beneficial plants for insects. And uh, so I, we made a list of all the plants, not all the plants, but a small list of the plants we have. Um, I think it was over 100 species, but that was definitely not complete. Um, I, I put together a packet with photographs and um, a letter saying we're not appealing. We we're just letting you know about this other law you may not know. It's called, it was um, it's Senate Bill 2080, which is a great law. And I actually made Xeroxes for, for people coming here, but I have them at home. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, it, it, in that law, it's, um, it includes a Florida friendly landscaping. Um, and if you look that up, it's if you mulch, if there are things that um, are drought tolerant, give you food, all these, there's different listings of what they do that's considered Florida friendly. Um, but it's a great law, and I urge you to look it up if you can, if you want a garden. Because um, it, it, it gives you the um, backing to do what you, empowers you to do the garden that you want to do. Um, so the city came back out, uh, well I called them and we had some conversations and um, they came back out and uh, it was pretty undramatic. He just kind of came in a hurry and he, he was going to take some pictures. I was like, no, I have this packet already for you. And um, he said he, he, was, he thought this was beautiful, but it was his job to come out and, and do this sort of thing. And um, once he got the packet, he was, that was it. He was, thought back, he was like running back to his car. <laughs> and um, I was like, wait a minute, uh, do, are we done? Do I need, are you going to call me? Like, <laughs> what's going on? Are we done? Or <laughs> and um, so he turned back around and he went like this, and he said, "Case closed." So, so so far, you know, that's, that's been the case. Thank you, Eli and Pat. Uh, <coughs> our next panelist is the. Uh, one of the preeminent Jacksonville hen experts. Uh, so I'd like to introduce Lauren Trapp. Um, expert, wow, okay. Um, I'll give you a little history about me and my, my hens. Um, you've heard the end of my story already. Um, I went to Costa Rica with my family. For a couple weeks we stayed on a farm and my daughters fell in love with the chickens. And when we got home, my husband said, we're gonna get the girls chickens. And I said, no, 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 no chickens. And he said, yeah, we're gonna get chickens. And uh, I said, okay, I guess. And after about two weeks, my daughters were kind of bored and they became mine and I fell in love. <coughs> they are adorable, they are entertaining, they are, just a, a hoot, and I got real attached to them, and then I found out that I wasn't supposed to have them. And so I said, uh-oh, okay, what do I need to do? And I started doing a little bit of research, and it didn't look to me like anyone was doing anything about the ordinance. So I said, well, I'll do it. And so I started an organization, Hens and Jacks, um, and I had no idea what I'm doing. And so, uh, got my, I know a little bit more, but um, I still sort of was just flailing around trying to convince people that having hens in your backyard is no big deal. They're backyard animals, they're not farm animals. They are historically, if you go back and talk to your grandmothers, there's, if you're blessed enough to still have them, um, or if you go back a little bit further, they're going to talk about having chickens in their backyards. It was common, it was. It was accepted. Sometime in the 60s, we all decided that, well, I didn't, um, but so a whole bunch of people decided that, uh, that science was better than nature. So we started telling our mamas to start using formula, and we'd just knock them out and wake up with clean babies after they were born and all of these things. Someone started a business called Chemon, which probably <coughs> wouldn't have gotten as far today as it did then. And we sort of went in and we said, we want everybody to have these cohesive looking yards. So the grass will flow from one end of the street beautifully all the way to the other. And which is great and all, but um, it sort of ignores diversity and all of those type of things and it's kind of boring. And so 
but it, it was it was uniform, and we sort of set up these city codes in a lot of cities to say we're going to tell you what suburban or urban life is supposed to look like, and we're all going to have matching yards, and we're not going to have any animals besides cats and dogs, and maybe some fish. And so we set up these ordinances, and they said no hens, no. Uh, egg laying fowl is usually the language that's chosen. And our city was one of those cities that did that. Some cities didn't, and when the trend really started taking on across the country in the late 90s, um, lots of people were able to do it without a problem. Lots of people did it anyways and didn't realize that there was a problem. And so that was sort of like me. I had my chickens for three years and I lost them two and a half weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And after crying and some other choice words, um, I decided, well, I need to increase my activity about getting the ordinance changed. And uh, right about the same time, I got contacted by some other people who were trying to do the same thing. Um, I have a petition set up. Um, there's the website. It's on the bottom of the sheet if you've got the chicken misconception sheet. We started a little Facebook page because I don't know how to do a website. If anybody wants to make a website for me, I, I'd love you for it. Um, I have the, you know, a lot of people don't want, or like, when I stood outside of RAM asking people to sign petitions saying, yes, we want chickens in our backyards, uh, people would say, I don't want that. And, um, I'll use friendly. And I go, why? Why don't you want that? And they say things like, well, they smell. Well, not a well-maintained coop with a small flock that's allowed to live in a healthy environment. They don't smell. Well, they're going to attract raccoons. You don't think we have raccoons? <coughs> Your trash can is attracting more raccoons if you don't have a compost bucket or a chicken coop. I promise I had less raccoon problems after I stopped putting all that food in my trash can. When I started putting it in my chicken coop, my chickens ate it, they scratched what they didn't want, which wasn't much, into the ground. They pooped, because that's what they do. And, and then you could take that soil and go put it on plants. Now, if you have a dog, you know his poop is toxic, I have two. And my chicken, <coughs> their poop is like gold. I mean, nothing makes the plants grow. Talk to a gardener. The natural source of nitrogen is what you're looking for, not that bagged stuff from those big box stores. You, the, the great stuff that you can create in your backyard is what your plants are thriving for. And the great thing about it is a backyard coop is easy. It's, as this gentleman said, you can start one for probably less than 50 bucks. You could get some old pallets and use the wood, and if you're creative, that's not what we did, but that you can. I had to, I talked to my husband, my, my way of trying to not have it at the house at the beginning was, I said, you have to find a suburban looking cute. And if you go Google an igloo, they're really cute, and you know, that's what I have. But that's not the way everyone has to start, but that, that's how we did it. And it was good for us because it was sort of, took away the learning curve problems. Um, it's easy to clean, it's easy to maintain, it's easy to get to your eggs and all of that. Um, and if anybody has any questions, I'd love to talk, I could talk all day about chickens. But the, the main thing is, is it's easy, it's educational, it's sustainable, and they're really entertaining. And a lot of the problems that people say they don't want chickens in their neighbor's backyard is those misconceptions about smell, which isn't really an issue, about um, noise. Well, I know my dogs make more ruckus in the morning than my chicks ever did. The um, attracting nuisance animals, we you know that's not really true. I, my neighbor said that um, I was causing a rat problem. And I have to say, since I had chickens and dogs running around my yard, honestly, I don't get too much rats anyways. But the problem is, is with the ordinance the way it is, you could cut down a tree on your property that was giving them shade, and they can complain about your chickens, and it doesn't matter the reason. Right now, I got a blue note. And apparently the yellow ones are better because mine didn't go away. I got a blue note on my door, and it was it was 
terrible. It, my my five-year-old, Mommy, I miss my chickens. And I do too. So hopefully we can get the city to uh, to see that, that you know, and everybody doesn't have to have it, but there's enough of us that want it, and it's not a problem. And everybody's doing it. <laughs> Thank you, Laura. Uh, next panelist is Catherine Burke with Breaking Ground Contract. Catherine brings a very unique twist to uh, urban agriculture. She's very focused on education, and she believes that the next generation of urban farmers, urban agriculture specialists, and urban permaculturists are going to be the students uh, that live today in the urban core. So, Catherine. Alright, I'm going to double fist here, see if I can do both of these things at the same time. How encouraging to see you all here tonight. Thank you for being here. Um, I feel like the rest of the panel, um, at, in the sense that the expert is standing at the other end of the room, I'm just basically following him around like a little puppy dog constantly on top of our roof saying, what can I pull, what can I weed, what can I pick? What can I plan and what's going on next? Because that's pretty much all it is for me is a constant education. So, um, I'm blank. David Reed. David Reed. I do have a flash drive if we need it. The, the presentation that I, that I brought with me, just a couple slides. I'm a visual person and I think to be able to really get a, a super good feel for what we're doing on the Breaking Ground Green Roof, you have to be able to see it. It's so full of life and color and biodiversity and insects and frogs and lizards and this is on top of our roof. So the first slide, if it were up here, we would be talking about the fact that urban agriculture is really everywhere. In our case, to find it, you just have to look up. It's not necessarily in the places that we typically look for urban agriculture. When you go down Highway Avenue off of I-10, which is a very industrial area of Jacksonville, you don't think about looking up. But when you go by our building, which is a very unique structure in itself, um, you can see the plant life. We I'm sorry, the slides just disappeared off. I think what's happened is Catherine had a lot of photographs, and this computer is very old and slow, so uh, Catherine's going to wing it. She's I'm made it <laughs> Flash you want to try it. Okay. So, in our case, you have to look up. We have not received any yellow notes, any blue notes, and it's probably because they don't know what's there. Uh, but actually, um, what, what happened, and, and the way this, this roof came about, it, it was really quite a process. It started with, and, and again, if we had the slides up here, you would see a picture of my sister Mary Takumi standing on her roof next to these beautiful <coughs> plants and flowers and, and um, an edible garden that was her vision many, many years ago. And that vision, when we remodeled our building, we did a complete renovation rather than building new, rather than using uh, green space, did a complete renovation on our 3,500 square foot building. And one of the strategies that we wanted to use as a sustainable builder was to use half the roof for solar, and half the roof for vegetated. And so this was a vision that came with a lot of commitment. It came with a monetary commitment. It came with a time commitment. It came with, I see Michelle out there going, it's that one, it's yeah. that one. It's <laughs> urban ag. Um, <laughs> no, that's the one that's not on. Go ahead, I'm gonna try to pull it on your Anyway. No worries, Kevin. <laughs> so the vision is really important. Uh, what, what our vision was, what Mary's vision was, what the vision for breaking ground contracting is, is for other commercial businesses to see that they can do the same type of thing we did. Our roof is 3,500 square feet. Imagine a Walmart, imagine a Target, imagine a Publix. If they can incorporate not only a white TPO roof, which reflects the sun's rays and keeps our heat island effect down, but imagine if they can incorporate a vegetated roof, which mitigates stormwater, which also brings biodiversity, which can be a food component for the surrounding community. 
So that was our vision, was to really show what a small uh, commercial business could do. If we can do it, certainly folks that have the resources, the people, the energy, the time, the money, all of that, what they can do with that kind of space. Um, I heard something today in the, in the wake of the Steve, uh, the Steve Jobs death today, um, which, which has affected many people. His, um, his counterpart, and is it Steve Wozniak? Is he also a Steve? Yes. He said um, when they go to the table and they look at incorporating or bringing out new products or doing new things, all of the folks in the room would always be talking about money and how it could be, uh, how how that process could uh, bring revenue. And Steve Jobs always stood there and said, "How can it affect people? How can it make people's lives better?" And I think when you think about urban agriculture, you think about all of these strategies that we're trying to incorporate in terms of sustainability. That has to be the first question. And I think our roof is one of those things where we say, how can it affect people's lives? It's not just sitting up there, it's a rural entity kind of doing its own thing. We're bringing kids up there, we're doing videos, we're showing people what can happen. And we actually have a young lady who came up and um, <laughs> there's all kinds of stuff on that flash drive. What else do you want to do? Um, um, so we brought a group of kids up. We do a monthly video on our blog, BreakingGroundRoot.com. There it is. You have to look up. There's where we started. Uh, and I'm also, a, a, I, I like to pretend that I'm a photographer, so it, it also gives me an outlet for, for using my camera. Um, but anyway, one of the things that we do, we, we bring children up. We do a monthly um, blog video. It has a different focus every month. And one of the little girls who came up, who's 10 years old, she's actually now a guest blogger on our Breaking Ground Green Roof blog, she did a food video. And you would think that she was like doing it for a year. She went home, her parents videotaped her. She's like, hi, I'm Isabel. And she's got all her vegetables that she picked from our roof. So amazing. I mean, this little girl had never seen a vegetated roof in her entire life. She had a first experience standing on top of our roof picked vegetables from it, went home, cut them up, and made dinner for her parents, and did a video from it. Mm -hmm. As a public school teacher, I'm thinking that's pretty wild. <laughs> um, oh, keep clicking. We're happy. Yeah. And there's Mary. That's Mary Takuni. She's the owner of our company. Uh, again, we're, we're general contractors. Our core business is building buildings. So Mary's vision for her company was to make sure that we were trying to mitigate as much as we can the effects that we have on the environment. Although it's our business, how can we impact it as little negatively as possible? So this was a huge, a huge impact um, on this renovation. Go ahead, Kevin. Quick point, look at the HVAC air intake. It's right above the plant. That office is pumped full of oxygen. Yes, and, and the lines coming off that, those HVAC units, the condensate is going to the garden. So again, no waste, no potable water is being, no, no water period is being used on that rooftop garden other than um, the, uh, the rainwater and the HVAC. Okay, that, that'll just kind of start going on its own, so I'll tell you in a second when it hit it. This is a little condensate line being pumped up from the um, server room, because the server room needs its own little AC unit to keep everything nice and cool in there. It's very special. Um, and so, again, planning and processes have to come very early. Whether it's a community garden you're planning, whether it's building pen houses, whatever it is you're going to do, you need to be thinking futuristically as to the, sustain the sustainability of that whole process. Um, Kevin <coughs> incorporated um, some underlayment mats that all of the plants, the root systems grow through these. We call it gorilla hair for the sake of the kids, but they're called Inca mats, tested by the University of Florida. So again, there's research, there's a science to it. You don't just go and you know dump thousands of pounds of soil on your roof and start growing plants. It's not how it works. Obviously, structurally, it had to be um, more sound than a building that does not have that. And of course, Kevin there planting. If you saw the roof now, you, you, you wouldn't even recognize it. I mean, it's just crazy how it's grown. And then up here shows the, the, um, both the solar panels in the background as well as the vegetated roof. So you can see there's a lot of sustainability going on with this. And then the car hats, I just think, are priceless. These are, these are children of one of our superintendents, and they were going to the job site. <laughs> so they have their little hard hats on, and they have their little tool belts and their rope bands. 
And this was one of the videos we did where they were harvesting and planting at, on, on the roof on the same day. Okay, Kevin. And then uh, what Eli and Val referred to earlier, the biodiversity piece of it. This is what really blew me away, because the whole time that I knew I would be involved with this project as the education director for our company, I had no idea how the minute we started putting greenery on that roof, how things would just, not only that would one or two come, but they to their friends, next thing you know, the bees are all you know coming around, the dragonflies are calling their buds, the tree frogs are there, the birds are there, things are eating seeds, they're dropping seeds. It is just the craziest thing, and this is in 1,400 square feet. It's not a lot of space, but it is just constant. And if you go up in the morning, certain times of the, of the year, especially during the summer, the roof is basically moving. There is so much activity going on up there. Um, and we just love the look of the natural grasses, the natural wildflowers, everything up there is native or, um, or adaptable. Um, and, and again, you can see the food component. Uh, it was real interesting, the ladybug thing, within days, I, I told Kevin, I go, yeah, I ate this. And he's like, that's okay. Within a day of me telling him that, the ladybugs were on the roof. <coughs> they know there's food there, and they head over, and they know what to do. So it was very cool, and we, we blog about it. Every day we try to put something on the blog, and we talk about the, um, the ladybug infestation that we have, which was really awesome. And then getting the message out. We don't want to keep this to ourselves. The whole point of what we do as a contractor who educates our industry is to um, use everything we have at our disposal. I will tell you, I do try to Facebook. I don't love Facebook. If they change it one more time, I'm jumping it. It's just like every time I learn it, they put something new on there. But we do have a Facebook page um, that you see down here, Breaking Ground Green Roof. We do have our blog, breakinggroundgreenroof.com, which Kevin and I um, have been doing since before the roof was planted. So there's photos on there when the roof was totally flat. Uh, there's videos. We post our monthly videos on there. And then, um, of course, I'm doing this when I'm not supposed to be, but um, we're at BG uh, Green Roof on Twitter. So every so often, uh, you will see us posting on there. Kevin is a tweet, tweeting fanatic, and he's got like 3,000 followers, so I really don't have to do much. I just have to say, ooh, wasn't that cool? And I know he's going to tweet it. Okay? <laughs> Last slide, I think. And then, do we have time to hit? It's about a minute, 30 seconds. If you just hit that link. I'm not sure if it was time. Okay. That's right. That's okay. This, um, if you want, just go on the blog. All of the videos are posted. This was one of the videos we did with the kids, and it's just really impactful to see them going around and doing their thing. And, and just to, to, to kind of wrap up here, I know I've probably gone long, which is very typical of me. Um, but one of the things that we think is, is the most important thing that we can do, this next generation, they are the sustainability natives. We are not. We didn't grow up, some of us did. Some of us did not grow up with it. We're learning it, we're relearning it, but these kids, when they walk up on the roof and you go, hey, have you ever seen this? They're like, yeah, of course we've seen it. I'm like, yeah, where'd you see it? In a book? No, you're gonna see it right here. And they're experiencing it. They're getting it real and true for the first time and they're touching it and smelling it and breathing it. And that's what we wanna see happening more around Jacksonville. Thank you for your time. Give me a quick second to uh, change out this USB. Um, the the, the Pruning Sisters, their enthusiasm with respect to sustainability and green construction is contagious. And I'm just so thankful that Jacksonville has Breaking Ground Contracting as a resource. And I would encourage you, if, uh, you have, if you're not aware of their educational outreach efforts, to please get in touch with Catherine and uh, find out what they're doing because they're really reaching out to the urban core and they have some uh, phenomenal programs for students and so be sure to uh, give them a call. Our next speaker is Alan Hall. Alan is uh, a 
It's great, great food. So. <laughs> I actually can't take much credit for the great food because it's our chefs who actually put it together. So if I could have dragged one of them down here and said I would have. Um, but I've had the opportunity to meet at least half the experts. And one thing that I think is really interesting is we all don't like to call ourselves experts. I think we're just raving fans of urban agriculture and sustainable movement. And things that are really starting to take hold here in Jacksonville, especially in the past five or six years, but I can talk a little bit about restaurants and I guess how we apply it to some degree. Um, I work with a group called Black Sheep Restaurant Group. Um, we have Orsay and Chew right now. We're working on a project in Five Points. Um, and one of the things that, to point out what Richard said, which is it's a good point, is we're really not pioneers. Um, for restaurant tours, we look to Alice Waters. In you know, 1971, started a restaurant in Berkeley called Chez Pani. And really came back from France and came back with an idea that community can grow their own product, they can use their own product, and everything really is about sense of place. And it's really about what makes sense for your local environment, what you can produce yourself. Um, this local movement is new to Jacksonville, but not new to all of us, obviously, as you can tell from what everybody said. So it's really important to realize it's been going on for a while. Um, you know, we looked to some of the magazine editors, there's a woman named Ruth Reichel, who was the um, food editor for New York Times, LA Times, Gourmet Magazine, she was talking about it in the 1980s. You know, we wrote them off as really kind of West Coast hippies and didn't think it was really, you know, made sense. But here now, in the, you know, 30 years later, we all realize that as things happen and as things have evolved, as Catherine pointed out, I didn't grow up with urban agriculture. I didn't. I grew up with good food for sure, but was not comfortable or not uh, aware of chickens and eggs and how fresh <coughs> produce really can grow in an urban environment. So I think it's really neat that everybody's excited to get involved with that. Um, you know, I've hit on a couple things that everybody has said as well. The education piece of it is really neat. Um, we as restaurant tours kind of focus on. Getting the food. I mean, we get all this great food from people and eggs and <coughs> produce, and we get to do the really cool stuff, which is turn it into great food that people pay for. So there's really an economic benefit to it that can be balanced <coughs> out. And it's taken, I think, several years to get to a point where restaurants can do it economically and charge good prices for quality <coughs> products. And I'll kind of get into that a little bit later and how it all kind of comes together. Uh, a couple things that I think maybe have brought it into the forefront of mainstream America is a couple books. Um, when Bourdain did K Kitchen Confidential, you know, it was a bestseller. We talked about after nights of debauchery, getting up early and going to all the local um, markets within major cities. You know, if you're in New York and San Francisco and Seattle, you know, they were buying local before it was called sourcing local because they were buying in their local, you know, markets. So they were really doing it already. Um, Omnivore's, Omnivore's Dilemma um, came out in 2006, which I think was a pretty popular book and really made people think about where their food came from. And, you know, they got back to the Happy Meal and 50% of the ingredients in a Happy Meal are corn products, which is a whole other panel discussion that we can get into, which we won't. But, and then going back to something that you grow in your house and grow in your home and get from local areas. So I think those are the things that brought it up. Um, Social media, I, I think, has uh, been really good about getting people aware. It's internet news, it's all real time these days. I mean, you can take a former closed-minded capitalist like myself who becomes like a uh, really activist who really understands and enjoys meeting people like this and talking to people about you and how it can really apply individually as opposed to just you know certain pockets of the area. Um, one of the things, talking to our chefs as well about what makes it important for us, um, certainly the flavor is there. I mean, there are subtle nuances to great nuances from fresh corn to three-week-old corn that had to get shipped up from south the southern hemisphere because we're not in season, to eggs, which when you get them fresh a day or two to <coughs> three weeks old when you get in your grocery store, there are subtle differences. Um, are they great enough if you were to taste one one day and the other two or three days later? Maybe not. So, but it's all little differences which brings the level of your experience in our restaurants up. But most importantly, it's really about local. Um, the Go Low campaign has really taken hold. It's a big movement in the area. And we want to 
to support local farmers, we want to support local agriculture, and we really want to support the local community. So that is, of the chefs I've talked to, the primary reason that we do it. Um, educating people and educating youth especially to understand that is a great thing because, again, going back, it maybe wasn't talked about as much in the 60s or 70s as it is these days. Um, and then finally, you know, as a restaurant tour, it's important for us to have really approachable restaurants. Some of our prices are high, some of them are low, but really approachable is what we want to be seen as. And I made a comment the other day to some of our group, and I said, you know, the only thing we want to be a snob about is our ingredients. And that's the only thing we want to be a snob about, because it's really important that we get the best ingredients, the freshest ingredients, and then to kind of take a back seat to those ingredients and let them shine, let them be on the plate, let them really be, you know, let them be what you're paying for when they part of the main experience. So, I'm going to try to go... One of the things as a front of the house guy, I look at is the trends going on in the food service industry. Um, and one of the big ones, the next, is a um, slide from the uh, 2011 National Restaurant Association. So this is what I look at as a front of the house guy. And I think seven out of 10 discuss sustainability, local, or hyper-local, or children's nutrition. Organic was 14, by the way. And organic was a movement that is still good and was going on a little bit more about five, ten years ago, but local has surpassed that in our minds in the restaurant industry. And I think everybody else would agree. And local, you know, sometimes you do have to use some pesticides and that's again another discussion, but local is really what people are looking for. And it's something that as chefs, I know we have one chef in the audience, Eddie, who takes our eggs sometimes from our group down in uh, Palacco. But they've done this for years. I mean, Anthony Bourdain was talking about it for years. I mean, everybody was. So we're finally getting to where it's like mainstream and everybody is looking for it, understands it. And the main thing is it becomes economical. And that we can provide it to you guys without the perceived price that used to come with organic and used to come with local. Um, you can cook some of the local fresh vegetables. Now, granted, we use a little butter and some cream sometimes. But you can take things that normally you would never eat, and if, you're cook, if you cook them right, they're fantastic. When I was a kid, I remember Brussels sprouts, boiled, and dark green, and mushy, and they're the most disgusting things I've ever had. Because my grandmother, she's sweet. Lady. But now we do Brussels sprouts and cut them, salt them in butter, a little olive oil, or olive oil, salt and pepper, and they're phenomenal. And that goes down to... You know, Brian at Orsay was doing fresh black-eyed peas the other day. Not dried, not canned, but fresh. Out of a little bit of butter, of course, salt and pepper, and everything is wonderful. So that's one thing that makes it easy, you know. When they're in season, it's reasonably priced. And it gives the chefs the ability to change the menu on a regular basis, which chefs love to do. It gives the consumers the ability to try something new every three, two months. And it's always going to be fresh, always local. And it's reasonably priced. Um, the eggs, eggs again, we like to use a lot of eggs, but in a home environment, you know, we like, we're smart about it to some degree in that if we're going to make deviled eggs for brunch, they're going to be hard boiled. So there's no reason really to use a farm fresh egg for hard boiled, but if you're going to have a fried egg or a soft boiled egg or something like that, that's when we really let those ingredients shine. Um, and again, going back to the preparation, I think number nine back there, Simplicity and back to the basics is what people are looking for. And that is using good ingredients and letting good ingredients shine and let people appreciate those. We don't like foams anymore. We don't like get, you know, molecular gastronomy, all these fun things that were cool in the 80s or 90s and Star Chefs thought were the new trend. Local is what it is in our opinion. A um, couple last things. The way we think, you know, to support and actually, <coughs> You know, CSAs are important, community-supported agriculture. We've got a farm that we work with down in Palatka. Their produce is on the left. They bring us produce every week. It makes it so we can create dishes like the one on the right. Very simple, very clean, not over the top, no foams. Um, and it's really neat to see it come from start to finish. Um, and then we, the farm we work with down there also does Berkshire hogs. They do poultry, can you get the next one? 
So the chickens that are Rhode Island Reds to the left produce the eggs that you see in the center. They're the ones on the left. White chickens basically produce white eggs, darker chickens, brown eggs. They create beautiful dishes like the hash that Orsay does over uh, on Park Street. And then the next one is really the coolest, like, start to finish that I can use as an example of how you get beer in that dish. And yes, chefs drink beer when they come up with menus, but there's more to it. Because if you go to the next slide, my friend Ben, who owns Intuition, sends spent grain after he's made beer from the top left of spent grain. He sends it to Luke, our farmer down in Black, uh, Black Hog Farm. And Luke feeds it to his hogs and his chickens. He mixes it up with other grains as well. But so we get what, and I forget who pointed out the circle and how to use everything. Actually, several people. When you get waste that turns into loop speed, you can go to the next one, please. Then he feeds it to the hogs. And so we have Berkshire Tamar hogs that have little babies. They grow up. I'm not going to go to the next one. I won't put the dish that it turns into later because people are crazy about that. But it turns into a real true farm to table dinner where you've got a brewer, a chef, and a farmer talking about how what was waste in a year can turn into a great dish and a great dinner. And so that's really neat for us. We get to see it from start to finish. Um, as restaurateurs, we use a lot of products, so we try to find where we can use specialty product on special dishes, and we promote it as much as we can. I think there may be one more. Oh, uh, yeah, these are, uh, we also, it leads into other things. As restaurateurs, we talk about a lot of interesting food. Food is a great documentary. TAP created a month long discussion about whether we would ban. Bottled water, no offense to those that have it on there because it does serve a purpose. But ban bottled water from the restaurants, for lack of better words, because of the carbon footprint it creates and the king corn. You know, with Netflix and the availability to videos and information quickly, these are all kind of fun things to look at and they really kind of feed what we do as restaurants. Thank you. How many of y'all tweet the hashtag to stay in touch with what the group's doing is uh, hashtag Jack Urban Ag, all one word. So uh, if you have ideas, tweet out. We're going to go into the Q&A session right now. Again, uh, one question and limit your questions for a minute. Direct your question to a panelist. State your name. And if you don't have a panelist, then ask Amanda and I. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Carl Dickenbaum. Uh, my question is for Alan. Uh, I'm interested in the market for fresh produce and locally grown uh, farm products. Uh, in the face of things like uh, Restaurant Depot, uh, do these small farmers have a chance? Um, immediately I go to places like Ram and other local farmers markets and other markets to get that. Um, Restaurant Depot, I would guess, you know, they do such volume and such. You know, again, we do, like as an example, for basil, we use bags of basil every week. And so for, we would have, we could pick up somebody's entire half an acre probably production just for basil. So we have to buy that in bulk. And we do what we can from a farm called Twin Bridges out in plenty and things. What we find the most useful for small farms and their ingredients is when we're doing specials in smaller volume. Restaurant Depot is basically like Cisco, but they don't have salesmen and delivery trucks. So they're buying in huge bulk. And so as a farmer to sell to them would be challenging. Um, I think the grassroots markets and the Native Sons and the other local farmers markets that they can individually be involved with are the best places to start. You can sell directly to Whole Foods as well. Oh, I've heard, I've heard that. Yeah, directly to Whole Foods. The Whole Foods uh, managers have the right to buy items for their own stores. So you can go directly to, like, our, we have a Whole Foods in Mandarin. You can go up and talk to them directly. Uh, I think I just, it was hard. <laughs> just in time. Or may I introduce myself? Yes. My name is Carol Carcsonis, and I'm with friends in Northeast Florida Community Gardens. I know a lot of the information sounds pretty daunting here tonight, but I want you to know that there's plenty of local resources for anybody who wants to get started. Whether you just want to dip your toe in the water, or you want to go whole hog, 
So, um, and I encourage you to check that out. Our county extension office is a fabulous resource and we'll help you find a place to start to if you want. Uh, the question that I wanted to ask was about why community gardening needs, why does the zoning need to change? Uh, the map behind you has 38 community gardens listed there. What is it about them? Why aren't they getting cited? Why do we need to change it so that community gardening is allowed on the books? Who would you like to? I could tell you. I think you might have to that one. Presently, there's nothing in the zoning that addresses community gardens. Um, I was told that the um, code department kind of overlooks the community gardens. They turn a blind eye to them. Um, they need to be written in, though, um, as, as, a, as a use. I know City Council, um, I think they're um, looking at an ordinance right now. Um, there are some things that have to do with children's education, people being able to sell the produce from the community garden. Not on a massive scale, but it's part of an educational program for children. Also, there's nothing that's in the um, ordinance that I saw that had anything to do with secondary structures. If you have a community garden on a residential lot, such as we do here in Springfield, you cannot have a tool shed because it's a secondary structure. If you don't have a primary structure, you can't have a secondary structure. So there are several things that need to be addressed, and since it's not written in at all, um, it, it needs to be put in as a permitted use, and then certain things attached to it as far as what can be done with it. And I, I, I would also encourage you to uh, uh, talk to Carol afterwards. They have Friends of uh, Northeast Florida Community Gardens has a wonderful newsletter. And if you want to stay abreast of what's happening and find out more about how you can become involved in community gardens, see Carol and she'll sign you up for that newsletter. Um, any more uh, other questions? I'm Steve Mendenhall, I'm a teacher at Biltmore Elementary, and Richard just uh, gave us a grant for a farm, uh, for a garden, and we just saw a professional development this past Wednesday, and one of the things that the guy on the video pointed out is that we're out there saying uh, to our kids, the urban kids in New York and some of the other places, go out there and help plant a garden, which we thought was an awesome thing until the guy said, then you're having them plant it in a uh, toxic waste area, which we didn't even take into consideration. And either Mrs. Saltz or Richard, if you could uh, give us some advice about how to check on that before we do that. Um, sure, so there's two, there's a few different components to that short term um, is actually bringing in the raised beds. So part of what the program with Richard's um, doing is brings in the soil so that you're actually planting into a bed um, usually at least 10 inches deep. I'm not sure. I think, is it 10 inches on those? 8, 8, 12. Um, so you have a real depth where the roots are not actually hitting that. Um, sometimes you can actually put another barrier between that soil and your actual ground. So you're doing two things, one of which, like Val and Eli would say, you're creating that soil, so you're helping to condition it um, as well as allowing to put those plants in. You can also do a couple things a little more long term, um, one of which is that if you plant certain plants, they're not going to be edible at that point, but they will remediate the soil. And so those plants are then entering the waste stream, but they're remediating the soil and you have clean soil. Um, and the third thing is, is a little bit more long term and goes into that as well about just the issue in Jacksonville about the brown fields that we have in remediating those. And there is a group that has come into the city and is starting that work with the EPA um, and is looking to make sure that the reclamation that they do on those parts would include best use being for gardens. Um, so that's a little bit more long term. But in the short term, especially if you're dealing with Richard, I would say you know, rest assured that you are absolutely going to be able to plant um, and it will be safe for your students and for yourselves at the school. I would also encourage uh, interest in container gardening, even rooftop gardening. You don't have root uh, nematodes or the old toxic waste on the roof because you're bringing in good, good soil. So uh, in the urban core, we have uh, a lack of real estate, ground level real estate to put these gardens on in many cases. And that's why we want to get creative, encourage our architects to 
do living architecture. Like we have two architects I know in the audience tonight, Rob Overly and Corey Baker, who both are looking at um, uh, food walls and I know they have experience with it. I would encourage you, if you're interested in finding out how to plant plants, not only on the ground, but on your walls, on the roof, and in a container, uh, ask them. And I'll just say one more thing about that. I have uh, come to the point in my life where I'm tired of a huge garden. And so what I'm doing now is focusing on square inch garden. Our roofs are only 40 millimeters thick in soil. We're growing massive amounts of food. And you can take the tiniest container and put it on your balcony. You don't have to have a garden. You can put it on your windowsill. And you can grow all kinds of healthy, good food and vegetables. Other questions? Um, my father and I were just at the forefront of starting our backyard garden. And we were looking for like a good local resource for seedlings instead of starting from seeds themselves. And I was, okay, you call me. Okay. okay. <laughs> we don't believe in wasting a single seed or a single start. There's plenty of excess material when someone plants a garden. There's half packets of seeds and there's a few seedlings here and there. And that's the way this community works, by the way. We work together. Okay? That's right. Brian is going to go to the farm. Um, he sells stars for Okay, so you can try it out too. He's a, you go to Rand for two years. I do, I do, I do set up a Rand, but we're not sure. We're, we're still a few weeks away from setting up. Lots, lots of good available resources. I uh, want to mention one thing before we go back to the question and answer. I like uh, Trish Michaels. Trish, Trish is putting together a really cool website that brings together people and resources. There's some out there, but uh, Trish, if you take a couple minute or two and just explain. Uh, I, yes, I am putting together a website that tells all of our stories. I'm sitting here listening tonight, you know, even like the seed exchange. You know, there's got to be a way for all of us to network. And uh, we do have a great sustainability community. we got the green growers and the green builders and, the, and all these little networks. And I'm creating a website that allows all of us to come together and promote what we're doing. To share our expertise and network. It's called offgridgourmet.com. Uh, please come get a business card. Um, see right here. Before you leave, the website's going to be up real soon. Um, there are ways to upload feature stories. All of these stories, we'd love for you to write it, upload it on the website, link it to your own websites. Uh, there's a directory to promote all of these businesses and organizations and nonprofits, um, so you can find it in the resource. There's a veggie swap which could be a seed swap, a uh, place for us to list what we have extra, what we have to give away, uh, what we're looking for so that we can network if we have a little too much of this and need a little more of that, post it in the veggie swap. Um, and there's a forum for us to talk about what's what. So it's in the works and it's coming soon. And what I need, the right guess for what I need, I'm looking for a few volunteers to help me get some content uploaded. The skeleton, the structure is there. Uh, we're working on all of the stuff in the background. Um, my background, by the way, is marketing and advertising. So as soon as we can get your stories up there and told, I'm going to promote the heck out of this thing and let people know that we are a sustainable community. There are incredible things going on. Somebody's just got to tell those stories, and that's what I'd like to do. So let me know if you'll help me. Um, Put some content on the website. I also want to say that Trish uh, is, is not doing this green. Her backyard is a food forest uh, with all kinds of really cool stuff. And chickens. Yay, the chickens. I love my chickens. Anybody else have any questions? Well, I forgot where it is. So my name is Mary West, and if I had chickens, <laughs> I really don't yet, but um, would I get a notice like on my door if I was to like sell eggs? Yeah. Um, <laughs> you have a couple options. I probably don't even need that. I've never been called quiet in my life. Um, there's a, a website called backyardchickens.com. And there is a group on there that sells uh, backyard eggs in Jacksonville. Um, from what I understand, you're, you're going to connect with the person who's trying to buy them. And you sort of keep the the city out of it. Here's, here's the way I look at it. 
Every single person who knows is a wreck. But the, 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 you, someone who lives like clear across town can't really. <laughs> Let me see how I can put this. Okay. To get, to get excited, to get excited, they have to be able to see your chickens. Okay? They have to physically be able to see your chickens. And they cannot come on your property without your permission. How do they see your chickens? Um, my neighbor who, who um, called on me uh, brought the the inspector in her backyard and they peered through her fence into my coop which was hidden behind my children's playhouse in the back corner you couldn't see it and um yeah we're going to stage a crying if anyone likes to come as soon as they're out playing i want everybody to come over and wail and cry over how much we miss our chicken um either, either that or we're going to turn it into a compost and teach her what rats are really like <laughs> Um, okay, sorry. Um, here's, sorry. Here's the thing. Um, they have to see your chickens. They have to physically be able to see your chickens to sight you. It can't just be somebody said you had chickens. The inspector must be able to lay eyes on your chickens. So, with I have I have been soup and um. The house behind, I live here in Springfield, and I have half an acre in Springfield. I have hens and I have two dairy goats. And um, my neighbors all love them. They come by and see them. There's a part of my house that has, um, in the backyard, it has um, chain link fence. So, and it's back along the alley back there. But there's a house that butts the alley that was um, caught fire and it was improperly boarded up. And the inspector came out to um, look at that house and saw my. Um, hens and my goats, and takes, they have to take pictures. So because I had a chain leak fence back there, he could take the pictures. But yeah, he, he, and he told me himself, they can't, he can't, they can't, you know, come on your property, they can't look over your fence, that kind of thing. They have to physically be able to see him. But they can look over the person who's complaining if it's a yeah. fence. They can't peer into my yard if I have it fenced. But unfortunately, I didn't have a privacy. Yes, ma'am. Do that on the chickens, does it have to be a complaint? Or can just Mine was not complaint driven. Because I live next to a school and have an old chase. I have chickens, but they'll jump the yard to find my truck when I come home. I cooked my <coughs> eggs and that stopped the jumping over the fence. Well, I had to put a pin up, but my I was just told that it's a complaint driven system. That's what I was, okay. I was told. They, they say that, but I know for a fact mine was. Well, 13 years my husband told me we couldn't have chickens. And then I asked the cop, and he said it's only a noise ordinance. No, it's not. It, and is, then, it, is, it, it is in the ordinance, no egg laying fowl. It is You can have a Vietnamese hot belly pig. If you have a certificate.